I'm Nick Knudsen, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler on tonight's episode. We'll do a look ahead to this weekend's Orange and Blue game. The Gators are playing football this week, Will. Uh, it feels like yesterday, but it's back here for, for a moment, for a moment anyway. What info can we get, if any, from a spring game? We'll talk about that. And then who is going to step up at wide receiver? We'll dive into that. We know about Eugene Wilson. Who do we have in the room after that? And who do we who would we like to see step up? Uh, portal season is among us and it might be big. You're hearing from a lot of industry sources like, you know, your Josh Pates of the world are out there really talking about what's coming uh, when the portal opens up next week. You're already seeing some names uh, jump into it. We will discuss that as well to wrap things up. Will, let's jump right in. Spring game this week from Nick Delatori from On3. Napier said the following on how the teams are going to be split for this spring game. They're going to divide the players up to try to make the game as competitive as possible based off of who's available. And they're going to allow veteran players on each team to draft all parts of the organization, which includes the staff. So he said they really do later in the week. They start to split up and prepare independently, like on Friday before the game. They simulate a Friday before a regular game. They prepare each team prepares independently, uh, getting ready for the for the orange and blue game, which will be at 1 p.m. on Saturday on the SEC network or as it's SEC network plus. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like ones versus twos is what that sounds like, right? <laughs> Trying to make it competitive. Um, yeah, and, and that's fine. I mean, the reality is, is that the amount that you get out of the spring game is very specific. There are things we're going to look for and there are things we'll talk about, but the Gators are going to win, right? That's, and, and they're going to try to hide weaknesses. They're not going to show a lot of uh, a lot of things that are out there you wouldn't expect. Though, you know, let's be honest, Austin Armstrong blitzed a ton last year, and that was sort of maybe the prevailing thing coming out of there is, hey, we got a defense, and and that didn't uh, that didn't translate certainly the entire year. So, um, I, regardless of what happens, I don't get too high, don't get too low off of this one. But I do think there are things you can look for, and there are things that you know, obviously newcomers we want to see, and then and then new coaches and and new uh, new schemes that are going to sort of come to the forefront, and maybe some things we can learn there as well. Yeah, well. It's really something we, we pointed out a couple of times. We've seen the offense struggle in some of these. We've seen the defense struggle at times. When With the spring game, Will, how much can you really glean from a spring, a spring game? Like, what are you actually looking for? What details stand out? I, I know you can't go much off of the game itself, but do you really focus on individual players or how do you watch the spring game? Well, I mean, so I think you focus on who's playing where, especially on the offensive line. I wouldn't imagine, given how important continuity is on the offensive line, I wouldn't imagine that they're going to split up the starters, you know, hey, we're going to put a left tackle who's going to start with a right guard who's not. Like that doesn't make a whole lot, or a left guard who do, who's not. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? So I think what you're going to find, especially with the ones and twos, there's a clear division on the offensive line. I suspect that the same thing will kind of happen on the defensive line is that you know look if Desmond Watson is a backup then he's going to play with the other backups if if uh, Joey Slackman is going to be a starter he's going to play with the starters so you'll sort of be able to gauge that sort of stuff and then the other part is is that you know when it comes to the actual safeties which is where I think Florida has the opportunity to improve the most and also has um, the need to improve the most those are a bunch of new guys along with Jordan Castell and so I do think you can start to look at those sorts of things. Now, the interesting thing will be the emphasis in all of spring practice has been tackling. And the spring game is not necessarily known for tackling. At the same time, Florida needs to get better at tackling. So I am sort of curious as to other than the the black jerseys that they've got on the quarterback, so are they going to let these guys roam free a little bit and say, look, we're not just, you know, if you remember in 2018, I think it was, when Dan Mullen was trying to build up Felipe Frank's confidence, he had like an 80 yard run and it was one where they had him dead to rights like three or four times. And the defense just sort of pulled up and let him go. I wonder whether they're going to, whether the defense is going to try to maybe really start to lay the wood a little bit in this one, which would be kind of fun. But uh, you know, I think maybe that's the thing to look for is you'll see some attitude when it comes to the defense and, and the defense has been sorely missing attitude. I'll be interested to see whether that sort of is something that comes to the forefront. Especially in the secondary. I uh, saw a great clip going around, went fairly viral within Gator Nation over the weekend. Teddy Foster stepping up. I believe the tackle was on Wilson, really popped him pretty good. 
really hurt those pads. And that, it was pretty much a universal reaction from people. Great to see this from a defensive back. Where you been, Teddy? Like, welcome, welcome to the team. So true freshman Teddy Foster getting some early love from Gator Nation on Twitter. Uh, it's really – look, I'm glad to see Florida working on tackling. I'm glad to see Teddy Foster making that tackle. It's really easy to tackle somebody when the whole goal of the drill is to see if the offensive guy can run over the defensive guy. Florida's problem hasn't been that they're getting run over. It's been that when they've been in space, they haven't been able to make the tackle, and it's turned into a big play. So it, it's funny, too, because we heard a lot coming out of fall practice last year – going into that Utah game that Utah wasn't going to know what hit him because of Trey Wilson. Well, I wonder whether in some capacity that's because Florida's defensive backs couldn't tackle Trey Wilson. And they just sort of assumed that that was going to be how Utah's defensive backs felt. And uh, that's not the way it worked out. And it sort of worked out the other way. So that's the thing you got to be careful of. I think to make, I think you can make conclusions about who's going to be the starting offensive line or who's going to be the starting defensive line. Regardless of who dominates, though, I don't think that tells us whether one unit is bad or the, and the other one's just sort of average or whether one unit's great and the other one's going to be good. You just don't know in this case because of who's who's playing everybody else. So, um, so again, I think those individual performances are the things you're looking at, right? Castell, how does he tackle? DJ Douglas, how does he look? He's been getting a lot of pub this this spring in terms of how good he's playing the transfer from Tulane. How does he look? You know, there's been a lot of talk about Graham Mertz going downfield. You know, his average depth of target last year was 6.7, last in the SEC amongst qualifying quarterbacks. He's at 10.6 and 9.8 at Wisconsin in 2021 and 2022. So, you know, what does that look like as he goes downfield? Is he starting to take some more risks? The interesting thing is we'll talk about this in our preseason magazine, but his PFF rankings when not blitzed were really bad last year compared to when he was blitzed. That sort of differential is really weird and probably unsustainable. So what is he able to do when he's got time? And now he's wearing the black jersey, right? So nobody's going to hit him. He's got the opportunity to step up in the pocket. How accurate can he be? And then, you know, you mentioned we're going to talk about the wide receivers, which one of those guys can separate themselves. But, you know, again, I, I think there's a lot of stuff we'd love to read into it, but I'm not sure how much you actually can. If you think about a couple of years ago, Dante Zanders was like the star of the spring game and then had very few catches during the actual season. So you got to be a little bit careful. But again, I think um, this is the time for optimism. This is the time to watch the team and say, ooh, I really like what I saw there. And a couple of years ago, we also saw Anthony Richardson and Jack Miller, and it was really clear that Richardson was the best quarterback. So those sorts of things, I think you'll, if it's sort of like when you start thinking about five-star guys and four-star guys and how they're ranked. One of the reasons why the top 30 guys are so easy to – why they succeed so much is because it's obvious, right? Like you look at them and go, oh, that guy's got, that guy's like a man amongst boys. Once you get to the four stars, it's a little bit harder to differentiate. I think that might be the thing to sort of take from the spring game is, look, if DJ Lagway comes out and just looks fantastic, then – uh, and and Mertz kind of looks pedestrian. Okay, we really maybe have a battle coming up in the fall, or at least you know we got to think about how quick is your hook for for Mertz if things start to go south. Whereas if Lagway comes out and really struggles, it's just not an obvious differentiator. And so the the hype around when is he going to get his chance, when is he going to get in, maybe settles down a little bit. Same thing with the running backs. There's been a lot of talk about Kanan Daniels and how good he's been this spring. You know, if he pops a couple then it'll be a question of, okay, well, it'll kind of be what happened last year, right? Where we're all looking at Montreal Johnson going, he's a good back, but Trevor Etienne is a difference maker. When do we get Kane and Daniels in there? So those sorts of things, if there are guys who obviously pop, then those would be the things that I think maybe you can pull out of the spring game. We shall see Saturday, at one o'clock, 1 PM SEC network plus. So it's on plus because there, there's several other games going up head up against it at that time all right let's transition here to the wide receiver room on wruf.com this week they posted an interview with billy gonzalez the wide receiver coach uh they the post was by alexander Vefeus. uh it, he, billy gonzalez said it's uh live and learn right now referred to his group so it, it's a young group Outside of a couple of guys, a lot, a lot of inexperience, a lot of guys that they're going to be counting on that haven't had a lot of real game experience. But one exception to that is the transfer from Wisconsin, DK, who he says he's got a lot of football knowledge and got a lot of reps. So that's a positive to hear 
that he seems to be doing well. I've seen some articles too talking about how he's clicking with Mertz and being back with Mertz is a, is something they're excited about as well from their days at Wisconsin. Uh, Khalil Jackson, uh, he Gonzalez mentioned he's looking forward to seeing his growth this season. We certainly saw some good moments from Khalil Jackson, but a little bit sporadic throughout the season last year. And regarding TJ Abrams and uh, Hawkins from IMG, said they're both super fast. They care a ton and they just love football. So he said that you see them come out the gate, they go really fast, but then as they start to take in more of the offense, they start processing a bit. They need time to really adjust and step back a little bit, reprocess and get familiar with the system. So out of the gate here, Will, you see Wilson, Khalil Jackson, and DK. Those are your three guys that are bringing experience to the table. And and experience might be a heavy word for for Jackson and Wilson, those are still some young guys in terms of overall playing time. But Wilson did, he saw the field enough when he was healthy last year, missed a few games, but saw the field enough. And he's certainly your number one option coming back. But by no means a, a, a you know, grizzled vet, still a young guy that you're relying on to be your top option this, this season. And I, I've broken the rest of the group up into these categories here. You have your veterans who you haven't seen much production from, and Frazier's and Burke are back. You have your redshirt freshman who did not see the field much last year. I know Andy Jean's been fighting some injuries on and off. And Aiden Mizell, these are two guys that last cycle I was extremely excited about. I know in the magazine, the preview magazine last year, uh, in the bonus section for our Patreon folks, you had written an article about the wide receiver production for freshmen, and you pretty much nailed it on the head. You said you'll probably expect you probably expect maybe 30 receptions at most for one of these guys around that 30 to 35. That was about Percy Harvin. You used per- Percy Harvin as a good threshold for an elite option as a freshman. And you said it's not a position where you see every guy pop as a freshman. And we certainly saw that last year with Wilson popping a little bit and Gene and Mizell hanging out in the background. Mizell's got blazing speed. Gene looks like a solid, like solid, productive re- receiver coming out of Miami as well. So hopefully those two, one of those two at least will step up. And then, of course, you got your true freshman Abrams and Hawkins, who Gonzalez mentioned. So that's the layout of the room right now, Will. Who of these, of this group do you feel is most likely to step up and, and step into that to, uh, week in, week out contributing role? Yeah, I think it's probably Khalil Jackson. I mean, you start looking at what he did last year, 21 catches, 251 yards, it's 12 yards a catch. If you look at Pearsall, he was much more explosive. His first year at Florida, 33 catches for 661 yards, so 20 yards a catch. But to jump from 33 to 65 is a significant jump. Pearsall, I think we sort of think of him as like the most consistent player two years in a row at wide receiver. That isn't necessarily true. Pearsall was really a difference maker last year and two years ago was a solid player, but not a difference maker. I think it's the same thing when you think about Khalil Jackson as last year, he was a solid player, but not a difference maker. And the question is, can he jump from solid to being a difference maker? Trey Wilson obviously is the star 61 catches last year, though he only averaged 8.8 yards per catch. Um, We'll have a feature in the magazine this year that's going to be talking about how Florida gets the ball to Eugene Wilson and um, how they should get the ball to Eugene Wilson as well. Um, I expect him to be a much more downfield threat, sort of slide into that Pearsall role, which means somebody's going to have to slide into the Eugene Wilson role. I think that's where you start looking at the guys who have speed. A guy like Marcus Burke, who's been a downfield threat. A guy like Jaquavion Frazier, who's also sort of been a downfield threat. Those aren't guys who are necessarily going to be able to replace the little pop passes that went to Trey Wilson, which means, okay, now you're looking at Gene, Mizell, Hawkins, or Abrams. And really, Abrams and Hawkins are the two guys who you look at as like burners, though Mizell has a reputation for that. But in terms of is he wiggly enough to be able to go around the corner and be able to make guys miss, that's a different question. But I would say Abrams or Hawkins for the sort of pop pass type things. Jackson is the guy to sort of step into the secondary receiver role as they move Wilson to more of what the role that Pearsall had last year. And look, if Wilson can't make that adjustment to the Pearsall role, then I think Jackson slides into that spot. And so Jackson's going to get targeted a lot in that space. The question will be, is he consistent enough to make that? But I mean, so again, I I think, is he going to catch 65 balls for almost a thousand yards like Pearsall? 
Probably not. But would I envision him catching maybe 45 balls for like 700 yards? I think that's probably a fair a fair assessment for Khalil Jackson. And, you know, we, we talked earlier about the spring game and what you might be looking for. One of the interesting things is if you don't have a lot of confidence in your wide receivers, you switch personnel. So Florida played a ton of 11 personnel last year where they had three wide receivers out on the field, one tight end, one running back. Didn't always do that, but they played a ton of 11, probably more than you would expect from Billy Napier given his history at Louisiana. Well, if you're if you don't believe in your wide receivers or you don't have a differentiated wide receiver, now you start playing 12 personnel, two tight ends and a running back. And so now things when you start talking about who's going to step up at receiver, I think one of the guys we need to be looking at is Arliss Morningham, not necessarily as a wide receiver, but as a receiver in the scheme. If you bring in Boardingham and Hanson and 12 personnel on the outside, Boardingham showed he was a problem last year. That South Carolina game is a great example where he's not just a guy who catches the ball and runs into somebody to gain three extra yards. He's somebody who can catch the ball and make somebody miss. And so Boardingham, depending upon how he looks in camp, depending upon what Florida's seeing at the wide receiver position, I can see a scenario where they would have Wilson, Jackson, Boardingham and Hanson as the four receivers, as opposed to maybe always having a Gene or a Mizell or a Hawkins or an Abrams out there. Again, sort of depends on how those guys step up. Certainly Boardingham and Hanson are a drop down in speed, but they're also a, a step up in being able to run the ball. And so given what Florida is going to want to do with Graham Mertz, given that Florida has talked about going downfield more often, one of the ways you go downfield isn't just by getting more speed on the field. It's also being better in pass protection with two tight ends. in, you can do things like go mat. You can go max protection. You can run deeper routes. You can do things like that. So it'll be interesting to see, do they run a lot of 12 personnel during the spring game with boarding ham and Hanson? Certainly that's probably also dependent on true freshman Amir Jackson coming in at the tight end position. And he's not an early enrollee, so he's not going to be in until the fall. But Jackson, if he can come in again, sort of contribute in a boarding hand type of way, maybe you split some of those balls that were going Pierce all's way to the tight end position as well. That's a, that's a lot different conversation than we were having a year ago at this time with not just one, but two tight ends that we saw contribute on a regular basis, especially as the season went along. I really thought that back half of the season, I, obviously boarding ham s- stepped into more of that receiver role but Hanson quietly had himself a nice developmental season into a, a solid role player week in and week out. He was a guy that showed up pretty consistently every week for the Gators. So I, I think you got two solid options at tight end uh, coming in. So hopefully those guys can see a little jump in their numbers too, as well this year. Well, I mean, look, if you look at Georgia's offense two years ago, when they, when they had the two tight ends there, you had, uh, you had Washington, you had Washington and, and yep. yeah, you had Washington and Bowers there at tight end. Those guys are matched up nightmares, right? Yeah. And so you can't, you can't guard those guys with safeties because they're too big and you can't guard them with linebackers because they're too fast. And so 12 personnel there gives you an advantage in the running game, but also gives you a major advantage in terms of what your one-on-one matchups with the linebackers. And most times pers- personnel wise, you're going to bring in more linebackers if the defense has two tight ends. And so all of a sudden now you've got linebackers in positions where maybe there would have been a nickelback or even a dime back before there would have been more speed on the field. So you think about all those, all those uh, screen passes that Florida likes to throw outside. Mm-hmm. Well, if a, if a star or a safety is running out there to make the tackle, that guy's going to be able to get in the way faster than a linebacker who has to make that run out there to, to, to make that play. So it opens up a lot of different things if you're able to do it. The question is, are you able to do it? But if you look at the 49ers this year, they're a great example. Juxek at, at, at fullback, and then you got use Kittle check. at tight end. Yeah, Kyle, use, use check, use check yep. at, uh, at, at fullback, and then mm-hmm. you've got uh, Kittle at tight end. Mm-hmm. And then you got Debo, who's sort of a running back or a wide receiver. you got Christian McCaffrey, who's a running back or a wide receiver. The, the ability to flex all those guys in different spots – puts the defense in a really disadvantageous situation because they don't know, do they need linebackers in? Do they need safeties in? Do they need star, you know, do they need slot corners in? And what what happened pretty much for the 49ers all year long is they would find the matchup that they liked. A lot of times it was McCaffrey against a running back sometimes or against a linebacker. Sometimes it was Debo against a linebacker. Sometimes you got him caught in three linebacker coverage and all of a sudden now you got Kittle one-on-one on a linebacker. Those are the things you can start to do as you build the personnel. So when I talk about Kane and Daniels at running back popping, well, now you can start talking about running 
21 personnel where you got two running backs and one tight end. And now you got linebackers who have to cover those guys. So Florida's starting to build the ability to do that. Now, there are times where you just got to go three wide or four wide and you got to have guys who can win. And so Gene, Mizell, Hawkins, and Abrams are still going to be a major part of what Florida tries to do this year. But having some other options in there, being able to throw a wrinkle in there, not being able to, de- not being allowed, not allowing a defense to just go, we're going to run nickel the entire game. And we're not going to allow your personnel to dictate what we do because we don't really respect your personnel. Um, those are things that hopefully are going to go away as we see further development of boarding Ham Hansen and Amir Jackson. Yeah. It's nice to actually have a little bit of depth out of position, even if it's just a few guys. <laughs> so that's, it's nice to see that. So what hasn't always been the case the last few years. So let, let's move on here. Uh, we'll wrap up with this topic here. Portal season is around the cor- corner for the spring cycle. Been hearing this at a bunch of different places, but Josh Pate has been probably the loudest about it of all the people that I've heard in recent weeks here. But he says the post spring transfer window may be wild. And he says it's going to take you by surprise. He compared the, he said the Caden Proctor situation, the tackle that went from Alabama to Iowa and then back to Alabama. He said that's going to be mild compared to what you're about to see. He said, a lot of you are nervous. Frankly, you should be nervous. There are no players who are safe right now. That's quite a statement, Will. I, I, even in this current market where, you know, Florida's witnessing one of its best players step into the portal and go to its arch rival, uh, I, I, we've been on the bad side of this too. So I, it is certainly a double-edged sword with this transfer portal situation. But I do think one good point that, Pete made uh, talking about this is he said this might be necessary so this this might hurt some folks enough to where there's finally some uh there's gonna be enough rosters that are rated that there might be a solid conversation to inspire some rules to maybe stabilize this situation a bit i think right now there's a lot of things in court there's a lot of things pending I, you and i've said this a bunch on the show regarding the transfer portal is this thing's not going to be settled for quite some time. So this is something that we're kind of living in the wild West times still with the portal. We're still dealing with a a lot of things that you probably won't be seeing five years from now, but maybe not the worst moment to be a little, uh, a team that's a little down on your luck. Maybe it's a time where uh, I think my instinct right now, based on NIL operations to this point is I, I probably should be more nervous about this, but I'm kind of like, let's play with house money. Let's see what we can get out of the deal here. So where do you, where do you think Florida stands entering this situation in this type of environment? Uh, do you expect any big names to jump? And do you think we're going to land uh, anybody that work that, that would really excite the fan base? So I'm a little bit torn on this. I know Pate has much better sources than I do. At the same time, I remember everybody talking last spring about, oh, the transfer portal is going to be crazy. And then, I mean, who were the big transfers after spring practice who really moved around and made a contribution last year? There weren't a ton of them. And and then you start asking yourself, okay, well, why is someone going to transfer? Well, they're either going to transfer because of playing time considerations or they're going to transfer because somebody came and made them a godfather offer and it wasn't matched by the program that they're at, right? I think for the most part, after you've gone through a spring practice, you would think that you would essentially give the program an opportunity to match, right? So I, I, I'm a little bit less less worried about people moving around who are like major pieces of a, of a roster. Like I wouldn't expect DJ Lagway to go someplace else. I wouldn't expect, you know, Crenshaw Dixon and Devon Manuel to go someplace else. Those are guys who, whatever the NIL deals that they got to come to Florida, they're going to like, it would have to be a godfather offer to get them to move. And even then I suspect Florida would have an opportunity to match. All that being said, you still got to make the godfather offer and maybe the opponent doesn't match, right? It's it's just like when you've got like restricted free agency in 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 the NFL where, you know, a few years ago Lamar Jackson teams could have made an offer to him, but the Ravens would have had a chance to match and if they didn't match then you had like draft pick compensation things like that. But the matching part of it was the thing that just sort of drove people away is why am I giving him that money or why am I making that offer and tying up my salary cap if 
the Ravens can match it. I think that's going to kind of be the way this, this runs, which means that if you're targeting somebody, you kind of got to target somebody either from a program who's better than you or has more depth at a position than you and pick off the guy who's going to be the backup, right? Where he's looking at, well, I want to get to the NFL. I'm not going to get to the NFL if I'm behind this guy. And so if I can have, if the money is equivalent, then it's worth going to a different program where I can be the guy and show what I can do. So in that case, you know, picking off a guy from Alabama, picking off a guy from Georgia, picking off a guy from, you know, a Washington team or a Notre Dame team or something like that, where they happen to have depth at a position that you don't maybe is is where the guys will move i just i don't look at it as i don't see it as a place where unless the guy's unhappy now that's the thing right is if you've got guys who are not the starters guys who are not happy with their position then maybe those guys will move and now you're talking depth pieces and those sorts of things so i mean if 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 you're asking me where should florida focus i mean i think edge is a clear area that they want to focus you got george gums the transfer coming in not really a great profile. You got um, Pyburn, who's coming off of an injury. You got Justice Boone coming off of an injury. You got Searcy and and Collins, who are coming off of all SEC freshman seasons. But you're also moving one of those guys inside. You got LJ McCray, who's a true freshman coming in. You ex- you hope that he makes a difference, but is he really going to make a difference? You know, that's that's sort of the question. And then I think the other place to focus is cornerback. They've already brought in uh, Triquez Bridges, the Oregon transfer. But you got Jason Marshall, who wasn't great last year. You got Devin Moore, who was awesome, but has been able to stay healthy and and then you got a bunch of young guys you know you got you got Dijon Johnson and then Sharif Denson and Jakeem Jackson um, along with Foster that you mentioned and then Jameer Grimsley the transfer sort of quote-unquote transfer or maybe flip from Alabama Um, again if if none of those guys are showing up to the quality that you need at the cornerback position that's maybe the place that I would focus as well I feel really good about Florida at safety I feel okay about them at corner I feel like linebacker will probably still be a weak spot, but they will be able to make it. They'll be able to cobble together enough there. I think defensive end, especially on the interior, they'll be okay. I think edge and defensive end is a place where they'd probably want to focus. As far as the offense, maybe tight end, like we talked about, being able to go to 12 personnel, that sort of stuff. But for the most part, I think the roster is pretty complete. Given the fact that they brought in Millen, Clay Millen, as a as a third quarterback option behind Lagway and Mertz, I, you know, where are you going to upgrade? Maybe, you know, we talked about wide receiver a little bit. If there's somebody who just pops and you can bring somebody in who's who's better profile than DK, then OK. But um, so I, I don't expect some giant, massive change to Florida's roster one way or the other. And I really I mean, I know everybody's expecting it to be crazy because early sunny day was crazy and because the fall transfer portal was crazy. But if history is any indication, the fall transfer portal was much more active than the spring transfer portal last year. Now, I think this spring transfer portal will be more active than last year's spring transfer portal, but I don't know that it's going to be as active as everybody's talking about. So, so far, uh, Southern Cal defensive lineman Bear Alexander has hit the portal. Bud Elliott tweeted, so is Bear Alexander going to play at seven schools in seven years dating back to high school? <laughs> and he listed all the high schools he played at. He's played for Georgia, transferred to Southern Cal, and now he's in the portal again. So I, I – uh, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up. I think he was was I think he was a former five star prospect a few years ago, Bear Alexander. Well, you, and then you, you had, had a, you had a really good feature in the magazine last year, looking at all the transfers who had either come in or out of Florida, and the amount of productivity from those guys was relatively minimal. Now last year you could look at that and say you know there was Chatfield I think out at Oregon State, and mm-hmm. and there was uh, Powell Ryland who who wound up at Virginia Tech, and those guys performed pretty well. But, you know, you look at guys like Chris Bogle and and some of the other guys who transferred, there wasn't really a whole lot of productivity. And you look at the guys who transferred in, guys like Brenton Cox, you know, former five-star guy, has the Georgia pedigree, all that stuff, but not necessarily turn into a star. I, I still think that's a huge risk, right? Now, it's a question of dollars allocated and space occupied versus, you know, if you have three open scholarships and you can bring a transfer, then fine. But you know, if, if you're kicking somebody off your roster, essentially to bring that person in, then you really got to make sure you're getting return on your investment. I, I am of the belief that the transfer portal is an excellent way to fill 
massive holes in your roster when a lot of your roster is solid. I think if you're trying to use the transfer portal only to build your program, you're going to struggle. And so, uh, you know, look, Billy Napier made a strategic decision early on that he was going to build through high school recruiting. A lot of the guys he's brought in, ETN accepted, have uh, have have stayed at least to this point from his class two years ago and now last year's class as well. So I think they want to see what those guys can deliver, and that's what we're going to see this 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 fall in the field. One other interesting one: uh, Oregon State running back, star running back Damian Martinez. He rushed for nearly twelve hundred yards, nine touchdowns last season. He's also hit the portal. And Pete Thamel, according to Pete Thamel, he was set to make four hundred thousand dollars to play for Oregon State this year. So an Oregon State running back making four hundred grand is looking at the market, thinks he's got a better offer elsewhere. So I will not thinks he does have a better offer I, somewhere. I he did he didn't yeah. hit the portal until someone had made an offer. I was just hoping hope, it, hope allegedly. it's not a life wallet. I hope it's not an alleged life wallet offer. Well, I did see is, is uh did ne- Devin Shapiro get out of prison? I guess I saw that today. He, he sent me something about it. He, he looked a lot older than when he went in, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe some NIL, interesting NIL stuff going on in, in South Florida again. We'll see. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, it's just something that is being talked about a lot in the college football media landscape, and it's something to keep an eye on. I believe the portal officially opens on Monday, the 15th, I believe. So, well, I mean, look, I, I think we talked show, about... we'll have some more stuff to talk about on this subject. Yeah. Well, and we talked about it last, last year, really after early signing day, that there were teams that got left out and those teams had money. Um, when you talked about NIL apparatus and things like that, right? Like that if you got eight guys flipping, and, you know, you're talking about $400,000 going to a running back at Oregon State. You know, again, I don't know how much the deals were, but if you've got eight guys in the top 300 flipping, well, that means you've got available NIL dollars that are burning a hole in your pocket. Do you use that in the fall transfer portal? Do you use that in the spring transfer portal? Do you roll it over to 2025 for that recruiting class? Those are all decisions that schools are going to have to make. Um, and look, at some point you start crying uncle, or you look at your roster and you go, adding that guy does not get us to where we need to be. We need to develop people rather than bring in some, rather than put a bandaid over a bullet hole. And that'll be the question for Florida is, I mean, we've talked about this ad nauseum all off season. Is there really that big of a difference between five and seven and seven and five? So if you can bring in a guy who's going to get you to nine and four, nine and three, okay, well now that makes a difference. But if you're bringing in a guy who's going to help you go six and six instead of five and seven, what has that really accomplished for you? Would you be better off selling the hope of the young guy coming in and saying, Hey, next year, this guy's going to be awesome. You know, give me more time. So that, that I think is going to be the balance that every program is, is trying to manage. And if you get a guy like, uh, like freeze at Auburn, I think assuming he feels like he gets the quarterback that he needs, he's going to be able to turn things around. I suspect next year, and isn't necessarily going to need to fill things out with the transfer portal if he doesn't want to. You look at a guy like Lane Kiffin, though, he's decided to be transfer portal pretty exclusive. The question there will be, how overextended are they? Are there a bunch of guys on that team coming into the spring? And this is maybe one place where the 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 craziness, the fall transfer portal, will have an impact. You know, you think about a guy like Human Milan, if all of a sudden somebody who – you know, has similar value to Old Miss, realizes human Milan's making way more than they are in NIL deals. Does that person start to get a wandering eye because, hey, you know, I need to get taken care of the same way that he did when he left Florida to go to Old Miss. So again, I think allocation of dollars will play a large role in terms of where these guys end up. I think that's probably good news for Florida if it is crazy because Florida should have plenty of money to allocate based on sort of what happened at the end of the 2024 recruiting class um, and all the flips that they had. There should be some fun they're available if they need them well plenty to look forward to next week look forward to or dread depending on what side of the fence that we're standing on so it, it's uh sounds like it's going to be a, a wild rush here and we'll see we'll see how it goes uh maybe maybe more low-key like will saying but um it's something to keep an eye on for sure so anything else here will look forward to seeing the spring game this weekend man 
yeah, we'll have some stuff up on Reading Reaction. I'm sure breaking down the spring game. That's always fun. And uh, I got baseball games all day, so it'll be it'll be a late night. But uh, we'll we'll have something up there evaluating it. Probably something up there previewing it as well before the weekend. And uh, and yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's always good when the orange and blue get on the field again. And I say this all season long. We only get 12 of these, maybe 13 during the regular season. And and the spring is when hope springs eternal. So if you're anywhere near Gainesville, grab your kid, go to the game. Um, he'll complain while he's there because it'll be three trillion degrees. But uh, um, you know that those experiences, the types of things that that the kids don't forget. And you know, look, I got I got I got an older son who couldn't care less about Gator football. I got a younger one who who absolutely lives and breathes it. And uh, you know, we all know who my favorite is. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, maybe it's past their bedtime, so they're not they're not up listening to that right now. So that's good good for him. Uh. Yeah, I think for the kids, though, for anyone with kids, I, I do believe there's a Florida Victorious event on the field after the game to meet the team. So if anyone just passing the word along about that. So I know Napier mentioned that a couple times in the presser, but I feel like if you had like a – that would be something that would have been fun to do at 8, 9, 10 years old. That would have been a fun fun day at, at the field. So uh, definitely worth checking out. Looking forward to seeing the young guys play, some of the new guys especially – and uh, it's never a bad Saturday when there's some college football on, Will. So we're looking forward to it. My favorite part about the spring game, though, is when it's over, the countdown officially begins for Miami. So regular season around the corner. Can't get to the regular season until you get through the spring game. So uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting through this off season. So we're looking forward to that. For Will Miles, I'm Nick Newton. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. Enjoy the Orange and Blue game. We'll see you next week. Go Gators. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Stand Up and Holler. If you're interested in more information from me and Nick, you can go over to readandreaction.com. You can like and subscribe our YouTube channel here at Read and Reaction, or you can go to patreon.com slash readandreaction to support us, get extra information, and we do ask anythings over there every once in a while as well. So check us out. Thanks for listening.